Hey everyone, this is uh, uh, Bill Allison from the Sunlight Foundation. We're going to be talking about uh, the changes that we've had in the campaign finance laws and kind of how it's playing out in campaign 2012. Uh, we're going to take you through what the current state of play and campaign finance rules are. There have been a couple of court decisions, uh, some different uh, FEC cha rule changes that may be affecting things. We're going to give you an introduction to our Follow the Unlimited Money tool, <clears throat> which lets you track all outside spending. Uh, you can also get email updates from super PACs you're following. Uh, it's a great tool for following campaign finance. Uh, we'll give you some guidance on, on how to dig into these organizations. I think one of the big things that, you know, um, that I worry about and I think reporters should be worried about is if you're covering a race and suddenly out of nowhere uh, some group crops up and starts running ads, we'll give you kind of an overview of, of how you can track down at least some information about that for your readers. Uh, and then at the end, we'll have an introduction to Sunlight Academy, which is an online training hub that Sunlight is building that's available 24-7 with uh, videos, demonstrations, and help using our tools and others' tools. So, okay, I'm going to begin with a little bit of history. I mean, we, you know, we've, we've heard so much about super PACs and the Sheldon Adelsons of the world and all these people pouring money into races. In some ways, this is nothing new. I mean. Uh, before Citizens United, we had all kinds of outside groups. I think the 2004 election, we probably saw more of them than uh, we ever had before. You had MoveOn.org running ads against George W. Bush. You had uh, the Swift Boat Vets running ads against, uh, famously against John Kerry. Um, you even had nonprofit organizations that were uh, 501c4 groups that were active. Uh, and going back even further, uh, in the 1988 campaign, the infamous Willie Horton ads were paid for by a group called the National Security PAC, which was just a regular political action committee. Um, these were 527 committees, they were regular political committees, they disclosed their donors, the IRS, uh, and they could only run, though, uh, they were limited in what they could do. And the other thing to remember about 2004 is, that a lot of these groups got in trouble, that you know, around 2006 the FEC got around to investigating them, uh, Swift Boat Fets was fined hundreds of thousands of dollars, Move On was fined hundreds of thousands of dollars, some of the other groups that were active on the Democratic side were, you know, faced hefty fines, and even some of the donors, the FEC contacted them and sent them letters requesting what was their intent, what were they, why were they giving this money, were they trying to defeat, you know, George W. Bush or John Kerry, which those donors didn't like, uh, you know, getting that kind of correspondence. Um, I think the the difference is is that after whoops, sorry, I skipped ahead one. After Citizens United, um, uh, all of this has been systematized, regularized, legalized, and nobody has to worry about a phone call from the FEC asking them uh, what they were up to. Um, the restrictions were lifted on express advocacy in this court decision. And what this means is this opens the door to any group, corporation, labor union, uh, nonprofit organization. Citizens United was actually a social welfare organization, a 501c4 nonprofit group uh, that didn't have to disclose its donors. Um, they were the plaintiff in that case. So what Citizens United is, it opened the door to all of these new political players that can run uh, these um, you know, independent expenditures, and these can be advertisements, it can be paying for get out the vote operations, they can pay for phone banks and push polls and all kinds of other things. The only thing they have to do is disclose the spending to the FEC. So now we have all of these new groups. Super PACs were actually created by a different uh, ruling in a case called Speech Now versus FEC. But, um, and labor unions can spend directly from their treasuries and so can corporations, although we haven't seen very much of that so far. Um, so, in terms of disclosure and finding out, you know, uh, who the donors to these groups are, uh, super PACs actually disclose all of their donors, uh, although sometimes we've seen a few instances where these donors are nonprofit groups that don't disclose their donors. And this was, there was a uh, group called, um, I think it's called Committee for a Working America that got uh, donations from a group called New Models in the 2010 election. Uh, $250,000 from them. They're a C4. They didn't disclose their donors, so it's kind of this dead-end disclosure. Uh, super PACs disclose their expenditure, expenditures, and this includes television, radio, online, phone banks, get out the vote stuff. Uh, they list the candidate in the state that they're either supporting or opposing, uh, the candidate, I'm sorry, and the, the state that that candidate is in, or the district for members of uh, the House uh, that they're opposing or supporting. Um, 
Now, on the other hand, we have the C4s, the C6s, the labor unions, that they don't disclose donors, although there is one circumstance where they have to. Uh, they do have to disclose expenditures the same way a super PAC does, so you get all of that information on ad banks, ad buys, phone banks, and so on. Uh, they also tell you whether they're supporting or opposing a candidate unless they're running an issue ad. And issue ads are disclosed within only 30 days of a primary or 60 days of a general election. Uh, it's also 30 days of nominating conventions for parties, and there's a few other uh, events that trigger electioneering ad disclosure. And so these disclosures only list the candidate mentioned. They don't tell you whether the ad is positive or negative. And issue ads were what groups like um, Swift Boat Vets and MoveOn.org were running in 2004, where they would say, tell George Bush not to mortgage our future, or um, you know, uh, tell John Kerry to stop exaggerating his Vietnam record. I know that's not the tagline for the Swift Boat Vets, but you know, those are the kinds of things they wouldn't say vote for or vote against this candidate. Uh, and the, we're still operating with the old rules about issue ads in this election, which means that uh, there are two different kinds of activity disclosed by these outside groups. And again, one is the independent expenditures, one are the electioneering communications. They have very different rules uh, in terms of disclosure. Um, uh, and, you know, under Citizens United, you know, anyone can run express advocacy, vote for, vote against. Um, and until recently, we saw that most C4s and C6 groups, these nonprofit, and C6, let me just say, is a business league like the Chamber, U.S. Chamber of Commerce. There's another one that's very involved, Americans for Job Security, but also groups like the American Petroleum Institute have been running ads, uh, issue ads. So anyway, these groups were mostly running issue ads. Um, uh, that mention federal candidates, and again, they has those kind of tax taglines, tell Joe Smith you don't want higher taxes. Um, but there was a wrinkle, there's a, a, a DC Circuit Court decision, um, or DC District, a US District Court decision uh, for the DC Circuit, called, in a case called Van Hollen versus FEC. And what this concern was, the old McCain-Feingold law, the, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, which actually is still on the books, um, required that groups that were running these uh, electioneering communications would have to disclose their donors. For years, the FEC interpreted that to mean that you would have to disclose a donor if he gave money to your, your nonprofit group, whatever you were, explicitly to run that particular ad. And so all donors would have to say is, I want you to run a bunch of ads, or I want you, or you know, I'm giving you money because I, I support your political views or whatever. And you know, donors were never disclosed for these electioneering communications. Van Hollen sued. Um, uh, he won um, that case. Uh, the FEC has now said that they're going to go back to um, uh, that, that uh, as of the date of the ruling, which was March 30th, groups will have to disclose who their donors were if they were C4s, uh, if they got donations. Now, among the many exemptions that the FEC came up with, a group like the Chamber of Commerce will not be affected because uh, the FEC does not considering paying dues to an organization to be uh, a donation. And actually, if you look at the 990s of a lot of C4 groups, like the American Conservative Union, for example, they have both contributions and dues. So you may miss out on a lot of donors from those groups. Uh, but the, the bottom line is what we're seeing is that a lot of these nonprofits have turned to express advocacy. Um, and they're, so they're running um, independent expenditures instead of uh, these kinds of uh, electioneering communications. There is one group so far under Van Hollen versus FEC to uh, comply with this ruling. It was uh, the uh, mayors against um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of Mayors Against Illegal Guns Action Fund, which is a 501c4 organization. And again, under tax law, that's, you know, the 501c4 is a designation from tax law. They do not have to disclose their donors. But when they ran, ran ads this past Sunday calling on both Mitt Romney and Barack Obama to come up with plans to end handgun violence, um, uh, like, you know, the recent wave of shootings we've had, um, they had to disclose their donors, and actually the bulk of the money, 3.1 million out of about 3.4 million they uh, raised, came from Bloomberg himself. But that's the first example, and um, uh, so we're actually seeing some donors to a C4 group. So a few other notes on, on electioneering, which is kind of uh, worth keeping in mind. Uh, there is a ton of the spending that just does not show up in the FEC. I mentioned that 
uh, groups run ads between the, you know 30 days before a primary, 60 days before a general election, have to disclose it. Well, an awful lot of organizations like this one here, Restore America's Voice, which had uh, an ad featuring Mike Huckabee running all through 2011 in battle scout, battleground states, um, attacking Obamacare and showing pictures of Obama and Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi. Um, and talking about how we're going to repeal this law, et cetera, et cetera. None of that is disclosed, although that ran all over the country. And uh, the ads ran in North Carolina, in Utah, in um, um, uh, Missouri, a bunch of different states that, you know, at the time were considered to be battleground states uh, for the 2012 election. There is a way to actually track this spending, but the only way to do it is to go to the public files that the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, requires broadcasters, radio stations, cable companies to keep. Uh, and these are records of ad buys by political groups, including for things like issue ads. Um, <clears throat> the unfortunate thing is that none of this information, um, until recently, was online. Uh, and um, the only way to, you know, to get it is to actually send people out or go yourself to, uh, to stations and get their public files. And uh, I'll talk a little bit, suddenly as part of a coalition trying to get these, these um, uh, forms put online. Uh, this is what they look like. They're not pretty and there's no standard format for them. But they do show you, you know, the name of the group, uh, what they're spending for each spot, you know, what kind of demographic they're trying to reach, which is all kind of interesting information. Uh, now, the FCC um, had a ruling uh, and they just started on August 2nd putting these political files online. This is the same station and this is what it looks like on the FCC page. And I'll show you uh, this little tab here that looks like, um, I don't know how well you can see it on this uh, PowerPoint presentation, it looks like a little star with a couple of ribbons. Uh, that's how you get to the public file and, and uh, to look into it. But the rule only covers uh, the top 50 markets, the top four stations in those markets. It's only broadcast, it's only television, it's not radio. Um, and it leaves an awful lot of the country uncovered. Um, if you look at the, the, this slide, you, know, you can see the green a areas are you know, covered. There's, that's the area of the stations that are covered by the rule cover. And there's an awful lot of red that's uncovered uh, in just about every state, and including in battleground states. Um, I mentioned that Sunlight is trying to do something about this. We have a website up called politicaladsleuth.com where you can sign up. Uh, if you want more information about that, what we're going to be doing is building a tool that lets people input this information uh, and, and it'll help us get it online in a digitized digital format. Uh, we've got really good volunteers in Colorado, Pennsylvania. Um, we're working on Florida and some other states. And if you want to pitch in, you can also just email either my colleague Kathy Kiley or myself. What data is available on these outside groups? Um, I'm going to talk about a tool that Sunlight has built called Follow the Unlimited Money. Uh, it tracks all outside spending by super PACs, by uh, and all independent expenditures. You know, it's important to remember that political parties make independent expenditures, um, uh, political action committees, <clears throat> regular ones like the ones that donate to candidates make uh, independent expenditures. Um, and this tool really tracks all of the outside spending, everything that comes into the FEC, uh, so you can get it all in one place. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, you know, we show all super PACs, independent expenditures. We have um, all federal candidates and races where, I, where independent expenditure spending is happening, and we can break down the races by uh, the different totals of the different groups and how much is spent attacking or opposing or just mentioning each candidate. Um, we provide summaries for each candidate so you can very quickly see, you know, how much is being spent against Romney or, or for Romney. So if you're looking for a quick place to get a number for outside spending, and then we also break down for each committee how much they've spent on that race. So you can see here with Romney, we've got um, Priorities USA Action has spent the most, some 17 million when I made this slide a few days ago. Um, <clears throat> and Winning Our Future, which is Newt Gingrich's old super PAC, is, uh, is still on the top uh, three. Uh, it also has links out to uh, different things, like you can get um, the uh, Influence Explorer profile for this candidate. That's a site that Sunlight does, influenceexplorer.com, that has all kinds of campaign finance and other information about candidates, uh, companies, special interests, and so on. 
And then you can also compare Mitt Romney to the other people in his race, how much is being spent against uh, foreign against Barack Obama, for example. And the data that we base this site on is pulled straight from the, the Federal Election Commission. And I think that one of the nicest things that we do is we give you lots of links out to, uh, to the FEC sites. So you can actually see the forms, which we'll talk about in a minute. And you can download data. And this little tab right here at the top under the Follow the Unlimited Money uh, lets you download it. There's also explanations of the data right next to it. Um, and so you can download like all independent expenditures or all independent expenditures by a particular group. You can get for your state all of the donors to super PACs in your state, or you can get all the super PACs that are active in your state. Um, you can get donors and expenditures by state and by race. Um, so it's a, it's a wealth of data that you can download from this. Um, and I, I mentioned you can get to the raw FEC filings from the site for each super PAC page. Uh, there's a little, uh, and, and also, you know, the outside groups as well, like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. There is this little, as the red arrows point to it, the place where you can go to get to the raw FEC filings. And that can be really useful, um, especially when you're dealing with a group that you haven't seen before. But this is what uh, the page looks like if you click on one of those, those links. And this is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And uh, one of the things that's interesting is because as you're dealing with these organizations, you know, we all know what the Chamber of Commerce is. But there will be groups that crop up that you've never heard of before, and uh, you're trying to get information on it. One of the first clues is that committee type. And E means it only does electioneering communications or issues ads. Um, and all the filings here are electronic communications. Uh, and also note that, and I don't know if you can see the dates are kind of small, but they haven't, whoops, we want to go down to the bottom here. Um, they haven't uh, made any issue ads since uh, that decision in that Van Hollen versus FEC. Now, U.S. Chamber of Commerce may be spending money all over the country right now. I mean, we don't know because uh, some of the issue ads that they run won't be, you know, that 30-day or 60-day window, depending on different uh, candidates or races. So there may be a lot of activity going on that we're not seeing. Um, uh, but also it's worth noting that, you know, the Chamber of Commerce really wouldn't be affected by that ruling because, again, they get their money from dues unless they, you know, it is possible, though, that they do get some contributions above and beyond the dues. So uh, that may be one reason why they're not doing it. Um, the FEC has a complete list of the codes that I just mentioned on the last page. And, uh, you know, there's uh, different, um, you know, there's different kinds of committees that are shown here, single, single candidate, Senate, House, and so on. Uh, which can be a useful guide. And also note that the Chamber has a separate page on the FEC, just to make this more fun for you, uh, where they disclose their independent expenditures. And as we see here, here they're classified as an I. And you can see that they've really switched from, um, you know, it was all um, uh, electionary communications before that decision, and now it's like they're doing an awful lot of independent expenditures. And skipping ahead, um, one of the things that Sunlight's uh, Follow the Unlimited Money tool is we have a, a link. It's actually, we ran out of, this has gotten so complicated, we ran out of tabs at the top. But this is for what we call non-committee FEC filers. And by that we mean these are groups that aren't political committees, uh, but they are having an impact on elections. And we've got the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, League of Conservation Voters, Inc. That was a 501c4 organization which actually got in trouble back in uh, 2004 for their election activity uh, in opposition to George W. Bush. Got the Planned Parenthood Action Fund, which is also a 501c4 group, and a labor union. Okay, let's take a look at a super PAC um, filing. And this is one, um, uh, as you can see up here, we've got the committee is type is O, um, which means it's a super PAC. O is the designation for those. Uh, and a couple other things that are useful. We have an address. Uh, this is a group called Hoosiers for Jobs, which actually ran ads supporting Dick Luger in the, uh, the Senate primary that he lost in Indiana. And so they're based in Sacramento. Um, we have the name of the treasurer here, Charles Bell. Um, and uh, if you actually click down on the statement of organization, you get a lot more, well, some more information about the group. Uh, the very first page is just kind of a boilerplate letter saying that they're a super PAC and that they're, uh, they intend to raise unlimited funds from uh, any sources 
They won't make contributions directly to candidates. That's one thing that super PACs can't do. And they will, um, uh, you know, you just use these funds for independent expenditures. Page two, you start to get the detail. You get the address of the committee, uh, an email and a website uh, if they have one, and note that this one doesn't. But a lot of them do, and one of the things, again, when you're dealing with a group you haven't heard of before, check that. Sometimes you just end up in a reserved GoDaddy page, GoDaddy.com, but sometimes you can get a lot of information just from their websites. And then down here, you get the name of the treasurer. Um, it tells you whether or not they support a particular candidate. This one said it was a multi-candidate PAC, uh, even though they ran most of their money, or they, even though the only spending they've done was uh, supporting Luger and attacking his opponent. Um, it also gives you a telephone number, uh, and with, again, with a lot of these groups, this is going to be the only point of contact you have with them. Uh, and sometimes they'll list additional ind individuals who are uh, you know, assistant custodian of records, or there will be a different custodian of records than the treasurer. So it's also always worth keeping an eye on them. Uh, and then this is the kind of form that they file when they're reporting activity, uh, their spending. And you can see that they name the candidate name here. It's, um, uh, it's Robert Mordock. This is a, uh, an opposition to him. He, of course, was Luger's opponent. Tells you the amount spent. Uh, that's the green box. Uh, the race and whether they supported or opposed the candidate. And you can also get some information on who made the ad buy. And this can also be like one more contact, somebody to call to try to find out, you know, some background on these organizations. And all of this is accessible through the uh, Follow the Unlimited Money tool. Um, a couple of other features that it has, uh, right up here we have a tab for organizational giving. If you're interested in contributions by corporations and others to uh, these organizations, labor unions and so on, this is a handy place to get it. And these are culled from uh, FEC forms. And you can see, you know, a lot of these are not surprising, AFL-CIO giving to their uh, AFL-CIO Workers' Voices Pack. Uh, TRT Holdings is actually a company uh, owned by a guy named Robert Rowling, who's a, a big super PAC donor in his own right, and American Crossroads uh, getting money from Contran Corporation. Contran, of course, is the company that Harold Simmons uh, owns. He's another huge Republican donor, um, gave to the Swift Boat Vets, among others. And um, uh, so most of the companies that we're seeing giving to these super PACs are tied to uh, a donor who's already made contributions himself. I mean, a lot of times it's their personal vehicles. Um, and then a last feature, which I think is like one of the most useful things that we do, uh, this tab here, if you click on it, you can get uh, alerts from the FEC. You just plug in the name of a, of a super PAC you want to follow, and I just typed in priorities here, and you can see a whole bunch of different uh, groups use that word, and you just click on Priorities USA Action. Um, and then decide, you know, how much you, you know, it gives you different options for how often if you just want the 24, 48 hour reports or the contribution reports or the monthly or quarterly reports, you can, you know, pick what you want and then get it sent to you via email or even text message. And it's done through a site we do called Scout, which I just wanted to plug because it's such a hugely useful tool. Uh, Scout uh, goes through the congressional record, federal register, uh, state legislative sites, and a whole bunch of other sources and lets you search for keywords or phrases. Uh, if you wanted to follow, for example, the Disclose Act, which is trying to bring more uh, transparency to these 501c4 and c6 organizations that are making or are, are, uh, having an impact on elections, uh, you could plug that in and then it would update you whenever a member of Congress mentions it on the floor or if the FEC were having a rulemaking based on it passing, which I don't think is going to uh, be in time for this election, but it can be a hugely useful tool. Um, a couple of other things that the tool has, you know, it has on its overview page uh, some good um, um, descriptions, or, or rather some graphics showing you kind of how the spending is going. Uh, as we'd expect, you know, we saw a spike in January when um, uh, in the expenditures and the contributions. Uh, when the Republican primaries heated up and as they cooled down, it, it kind of dropped off. And now as we're getting into the general election campaign, it's going up. And I'm assuming that this drop in expenditures is, um, uh, that is kind of an interesting thing, but it's, it's um, something worth taking a look at, keeping an eye on. I mean, the super PACs may be keeping their powder dry, 
for the general election. Uh, and actually, this was the same problem that John Kerry had in the same time frame in 2004, where the outside groups weren't supporting him, and that's when the Swift Boat Vets were uh, running their ads. Okay, and one last thing, you know, and I think I'll just go through an example here of how you can track a 501c3 organization, or sorry, C4 organization, or you know, some of these nonprofits, uh, and at least try to get some information on them. Um, this is one that turned up, this is actually the last uh, group to run an electioneering communication, and they are the only nonprofit to have run an electioneering communication after that March 30 cutoff, and so they may have to disclose their donors, although I called the FEC yesterday and they don't know, uh, they, had, they hadn't you know, talked about uh, how they're gonna implement this rule yet, so, um, so yeah, they're, um, they're not certain whether this group will ever have to say who their donors were or not. So if you go to the page for Freedom Pack, and you would do that by just clicking on, let me just go back real quick, this little link would take you to, the, the name of the organization would take you to their homepage, and then you can see Freedom Path, you can see how often they file, they're a quarterly filer, um, and you can also see, I mean, this is a blank here, and if it's a super PAC, we will tell you that on the tool. So you've got a group that you don't know whether or not they're a super PAC, or you know that they're not a super PAC, uh, because if they were, we would have their letter and we would have identified them as such. So if you go to, um, uh, the link out to the FEC site, you see that they're filing as an uh, committee type E, meaning that they make electioneering communications. And actually, this group, like the others, has also uh, has a page where it makes independent expenditures. They eventually switched over. Um, here's a, one of their filings with the FEC for one of their, this is a, one of their electioneering communications. Um, so suddenly you get, um, uh, and a uh, custodian of records, um, this woman, uh, Valerie Phillips, and I actually you know, looked into her and she's somebody who does FEC compliance, which means that she doesn't know very much about the group or she's not involved in the day-to-day -day running of the group. What she does is she files documents for uh, the FEC, or for these groups with the FEC to keep them in compliance. And uh, a lot of times these people are not great sources in terms of trying to help you track down who a group is. But uh, page two of this form lists persons sharing or exercising control. And so suddenly we have names of people who are running the group. And we have Mark Erickson, J. Scott Bensing, uh, Stephen Troop. We also have the groups that they work for, Unity Title, SB Strategic Consulting, Pearson Digital Learning. So we know something about them. Uh, and that may give us some clue as to, uh, you know, the financial interest behind them. Um, you know, it's worth backgrounding these people to figure out who they are. Um, moving ahead. Um, so I'm just going to background one of them real quick. And I just went to Open Secrets and plugged in uh, Jeffrey Scott Bensing's name, or Scott Bensing is what I searched for. And lo and behold, you find that he has a revolving door page uh, he's a lobbyist, and he's a treasurer for other PACs as well. Um, let's see, whoops. Um, so then we can also see that he used to work for John Ensign when we go to his revolving door profile. And this is um, some data that Center for Responsive Politics gets. Uh, it's um, one of the very few things they don't make available for bulk download because I think they have a proprietary agreement with another group that gives them the information uh, but anyway, so you can see, he used to work for SBC, and now he works for a group that SBC Strategic Consulting, um, which we will find out is a lobbying firm. And uh, we, he also used to work for a group called November Inc. Um, it's always good to keep track of who these folks are. Um, I should probably update this with the 2012 page, but uh, we can see who, what interest he represents. And again, I think that this could be a clue to uh, who some of the donors to the super PAC might be. I mean, you know, there's been a lot of talk about lobbyists um, running these super PACs, an awful lot of the folks who do, do have a, some kind of K Street connection, as well as having connections to the political parties. So it's def definitely worth taking a look at that. Um, uh, and then you can also take a look at the PACs he serves on as a treasurer, and you get this one Freedom Path Action Network. Um, which sounds an awful lot like Freedom Path. And a lot of these C4 organizations have an associated or affiliated super PAC, like American Crossroads and Crossroads GPS, Priorities USA, Action, 
is the super PAC and Priorities USA is a 501c4 group. Um, I don't know whether there's cross-pollination of donors or not, but it's definitely worth taking a look to see uh, if they have a super PAC and who's giving to the super PAC when you run into a C4. Just going back to the FEC disclosure, um, we can see uh, the money that's been spent. Uh, we can see, uh, you know, what they're buying. Uh, right here it tells us it's, you know, the TV ad, uh, three men, um, uh, three men again. Um, so we get the names of the federal candidates who are mentioned. There's actually two in this ad mentioned, a state-based uh, candidate. And we get in yellow who's being paid. And lo and behold, it's that November Inc. Uh, group that we saw that um, uh, Bensing used to work for. So we can piece together a little bit more information about this. <coughs> Excuse me. Googling the group, and we, here we just luck out. They have, a, they have a page that tells us that they're a 501c4 on their contributions page. And that's always a good thing for groups that have websites. Check the donation page because they may tell you what kind of tax uh, filing they are, and you can quickly find out if they're a nonprofit or a business league or so on. Um, so we know an awful lot about what this group is now, or at least you know the people who are behind it in terms of organizing it and creating it and setting it up. But what we don't know is who contributes to it. And again, in coverage, it's always incredibly useful to point out uh, which groups are not disclosing their donors. Uh, a few other things that can help you when you're dealing with a group that you've never heard of before um, that's you know, suddenly running ads. Uh, the IRS uh, Statistics of Income, and there's a link to this page in the PowerPoint, uh, they have a list that they generate and update fairly frequently of all 501c organizations. It's broken down by state. Um, but again, the one thing to remember is that a C4 doesn't necessarily have to file with the IRS um, uh, a, you know, it's not like they need a license to do this. I mean, a lot of groups do file an application to get tax-exempt status from the IRS, but sometimes a group will just be set up, run for a year, and then file its first 990, and that's when the IRS finds out about it. Um, but, you know, but this is one good place to try. Um, a couple of other things uh, to keep in mind. Um, you can check the tax status of a group by calling the IRS. Uh, you know, that may, may be able to tell you something about it if they have it in their system. It can take 10 to 15 minutes. And also, uh, James Willis at the Statistics of, uh, Statistics of Income, who runs that page, can be, help, can be a big help with exempt, or, uh, exempt organization data. And he's somebody worth contacting as well if they're trying to track down a, a group. And then one last tip, and again, this uh, um, link is embedded in the, email, uh, the PowerPoint, rather. Um, one last tip on these nonprofits. The West Virginia Secretary of State's office has just great information on these different groups. Uh, if a charitable organization is raising money in West Virginia, they have to register there. You don't find all of them, though. Like, for example, American Crossroads and, uh, I'm sorry, Crossroads GPS, I'm sure, has probably solicited money in West Virginia via the internet. Um, uh, but they don't, um, they're not on file there. But a lot of groups are, including this one. Uh, Restore America's Voice, which I mentioned earlier, and not only do you get you know information about you know who's behind the group, who's running it, and so on, but they even have to file when they um, register as a charity things like their projected budget, uh, and so you can see what they're looking to spend and raise, um, and you can also and it also has information like who their officers and um, um, uh, executives are. So can be a very useful tool uh, if, you're if they're lucky enough to file in West Virginia. Um, so I guess at this point, um, why don't I pause for questions real quick, if there are. Um, so the question is about non-coordination. And uh, the, I can go quickly through the rules. Um, under uh, FEC rules right now, you cannot coordinate uh, expenditures between a campaign and a super PAC. Although the rules are pretty loosey-goosey uh, in the sense that, you know, what you really need to prove is there was a secret meeting between a candidate or a campaign chairman or a campaign, um, uh, you know, the, the chairman of the campaign uh, or somebody running the campaign with, um, uh, you know, where they talked about strategy and talked about actual spending. When Newt uh, Gingrich does, um, 
uh, something along the lines of saying in public, I'm going to start going after Bain Capital and Romney's Bain Capital record, which happened in the, you know, after the Iowa primary, and winning our future starts running ads attacking uh, Romney over um, Bain Capital, that's not coordination because it happened in public. And, the, and so it's only if there's you know, this kind of private coordination. Now, I think that one of the things about coordination is that it doesn't necessarily have to happen. I mean, most of the people running these super PACs are political pros themselves. A lot of them come from the biggest super PACs from groups like the National, Republican National Committee or the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. So they know what to do, and they don't necessarily need to talk to a candidate to understand what they're doing. Another way they can find out what's going on, though, if they really need the information, uh, there's a limited number of people who do ad buys. They can find out from either the stations or the people doing the ad buys where a candidate is spending. And this happens all the time. In part, you know, you, what you find is a lot of campaigns, uh, in, as part of their research on the opposition, will contact media buyers to find out where they're buying. So it's very easy to get that kind of information on coordination. Now, the question was specifically on joint fundraising committees um, uh, and whether they can uh, coordinate with super PACs. And, and if the joint fundraising committee, in the sense that it's run by uh, the candidate uh, or you know his staff, they can't coordinate spending with um, uh, a super PAC. They can coordinate fundraising, though. And this was something um, James Bopp, the lawyer who gave us Citizens United, is the one who um, also um, uh, started a super PAC called, I believe it was called the Republican Super PAC. And the idea behind this was he was going to get federal candidates and party officials and people who were covered by the old rules in McCain-Feingold that prevented candidates and party officials from raising money from 527s and get them to raise money for super PACs. And the FEC uh, ruled on, there was an advisory opinion request, actually a couple of Democratic super PACs wanted to raise money this way. Um, they went to the FEC and asked if this was OK, and the FEC said, yes, it was. Uh, as long as the candidates don't raise more than FEC permitted amounts. So I can, if I'm a candidate, uh, say I'm Newt Gingrich, I can say to Sheldon Adelson, why don't you contribute $5,000 to winning our future? And so Sheldon Adelson says, I'd like to contribute $5,000 to winning our future. And the guys running winning our future say, well, why don't you contribute $10 million? Which is, uh, you know, what he ended up doing. So there are, you know, that is, is perfectly OK. And uh, we have seen uh, some instances of fundraisers where you have you know, candidates involved uh, in raising money for super PACs. And even in uh, 2000, 2011, uh, there was an email sent out by, um, uh, I think it was the majority PAC, which is raising money for Senate Democrats. And it was signed by John Kerry trying to raise money for this group. So uh, we have seen uh, that happening. And Josh, would you like to talk about Sunlight Academy? So Sunlight Academy is a new uh, training site and portal that we've created um, here that walks you through doing uh, different, using our tools and using our research methods to uh, help inform your reporting. So you can sign up, uh, uh, it's all free. You can sign up through, uh, I think, Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and that will help you keep track of the training modules you've gone through. And then the modules, and we'll be adding to them regularly, it just launched today. And I believe we have about a dozen modules here. And we've broken them up into different categories. So for example, there are some modules on data visualizations, mapping campaign finance data, uh, and, and even some basic, um, basic data manipulation that you can do in, say, Microsoft Excel using pivot tables. We talk a bit about our uh, different projects we have and different tools that we use, uh, such as how to track lobbying. And of course, you can see this on the screen. Uh, different uh, governmental uh, tracking services we have, such as Scout, which uh, Bill mentioned earlier. Um, and how to use our APIs. Um, so if you're more uh, inclined in the developer community or if you're not, but maybe you have some developers in your office, you can go to them and say, hey, Sunlight's got these APIs to uh, make it easier to access the data that we have and, uh, and use it in our site and our stories. And so these modules walk you through that. So as an example, one of them I'll show here is the uh, mapping campaign finance. And the module walks you through. It uses text 
uh, images, uh, videos, and allows you to uh, follow along and go at your own pace. So some of these clips will actually walk you through some of the process of what you're trying to do. And by the time you get to the end of the page, uh, you can mark it as complete and that will show up on that list of modules so you can see which uh, training modules you've you've completed and what you still have to do if you if you want to do them uh, and one of the things we really want to uh, encourage is uh, feedback and discussion um, obviously we can't in a module like this uh, cover every everything that you might do um, and we're trying to give examples and, and sort of demonstrate what can be done but we really are looking for people to uh, uh, communicate with us and say, you know, this is terrific. I'm trying to do something a little bit different. I'm running into this problem. How do I how do I solve that? Or uh, do you have a module that might uh, uh, talk a bit more about um, one of the other projects that Bill had earlier mentioned that maybe we haven't created yet? And so knowing what people are looking for can help us uh, decide what we want to uh, what we want to do next. That's, uh, that's training.sunlightfoundation.com, and it launched today. Okay, I guess we have one last chance for questions if there's more. Uh, there's one that just came up about uh, the um, 527 groups uh, getting in trouble for uh, 2004. Uh, actually, the FEC website has um, you know amazing uh, files on these that are worth taking a look at, including you know them sending letters to guys like George Soros and, um, and uh, Bob Perry and some of the big donors, Harold Simmons, um, you know, asking them about their donor intent and these you know, uh, irate responses from their lawyers. So that's worth taking a look at. And uh, beyond that, I mean, you know, it's funny. It was not really, um, you know, I went looking because I thought that somebody must have done a book on this. Um, but there really wasn't any good coverage of, you know, there, there's a lot of news stories that came out and obviously, you know, papers covered when they were fined and some of the different issues, but nobody's really looked into those investigations. And I think that that's a really interesting story uh, that probably hasn't been told. Any other questions? Okay, a question, I'm not quite sure, how would the research change if one went by issue rather than name of organization? Um, you know, if you go to the site influenceexplorer.com, and you can get a list of different industries. Um, uh, it was one of the tabs on the site and look for, um, I, I would just start with education and then you get a breakdown and I'm sure you get secondary and, um, and higher education uh, universities and community colleges and universities and colleges and so on and start looking at the ones that are really politically active. Um, that would be one way. Um, if you're trying to do it, you know, with, um, some of the outside spending groups. Um, and I'm trying to think, you know, we haven't seen too many universities involved, although we just did a, um, uh, a report on uh, outs of, of uh, lobbying interests that um, honor lawmakers by, let's say, um, uh, you know, they having an honorary dinner or uh, and, the, and, you know, a couple of the biggest ones were universities. Vanderbilt, um, you know, stored all of Lamar Alexander's papers and had this lavish dinner for him and, uh, and you know, several different types of events. And, of course, you know, he's a senator. Uh, Vanderbilt is, you know, wants federal money. Um, I'd also look at the lobbying uh, side, which you can also get an influence explorer if you're looking at specific um, universities. Uh, we can see there, you know, Harvard University, some of the top players. Um, so I look at the lobbying by the, these group, these individual universities, and what are the issues. And and again, I think if you look at um, uh, you know the big spenders, and generally speaking, the ones that make the most campaign contributions will also be spending a lot on lobbying. And um, and so and, and look at the issues that they're they're interested in, and then and look at the you know also the um, candidates they're contributing to. I think we'll wrap it up. Um, thank you so much for taking part and uh, I hope it was informative and useful and again there's the contacts up there you know feel free to uh, holler if you have a specific question about something. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.